Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Poddywood. And I can't believe we're up to episode 56 already. This It seems like only yesterday that we kicked all this endeavour off. Uh, but I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester. And with me as always is... Holy shit, it really has been 56 episodes. 56 episodes. That's I, not I counting all was... the After Dark stuff as well. Oh my god, yeah. In that case mm. it would be up to 57. <laughs> <laughs> and a half. And half, yes. Uh, yeah, that would be uh, me, Andrew Roger Carson, your co-host of Pollywood. Lovely to be back with you again, Steve. Yes, as and we you do too. every week. De- definitely <laughs> every week. Def- definitely every week. It's what, not the what, magic what have you heard? No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know what? It's it's been weird. I've um, I've been getting back into the habit of trying to at least watch one movie a day, and I've got to give a, a special shout out to. Uh, a movie that I watched last night called Cha Cha Real Smooth, uh, which some of you can see on Apple TV. Right. Oh, it's one of those movies that fully just reinvigorates you for independent film. You know, kind of like Once did when you saw it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this was a really amazing film. I mean, it's it's really character based, very independent. Dakota Johnson is the only known cast member, and oh no, tell a lie, Leslie Mann. And uh, the guy that looks like Frankenstein from Everyone Loves Raymond. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, him. Yeah, him. Uh, I've forgotten his name, sorry. I can't remember. That's the horriblest way to explain a person. I hope he doesn't come on the show and he's just going to, you know, sit on fire. I really hated that thing that you did and the way that Steve did that impression and it sounded like a stone Stallone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just like that. So what is it? Is it kind of like a, a street dancing kind of step up to the streets kind of thing, except with decent actors in it? And a decent no, play? no, it's it's one, it's got the most accurate portrayal of autism I think I have ever seen. All right. Right. And as a ch- as a parent for two children who have autism, you know, it's very rare that you get something that you can agree on and say, yes, that is great. But there's a girl's performance in this that is absolutely amazing. And it's basically around um, a story around a 22-year-old guy whose job is basically getting the party started at things like bar mitzvahs and things like that, kind of mm-hmm. like an MC style. And uh, he ends up falling in love with Dakota Johnson's single mother. It's a nice comedy. It's really likable characters. You know, there's romance in there and it's one of those movies where one minute you'll be laughing you know one minute you'll be crying you know the next minute you'll be howling oh wait a minute speaking of howling steve let's get back to what's in the box from last week well done well done well done you know cha-cha real smooth is a great movie check it out by the way <laughs> uh yeah well um you very very smoothly segued into uh into what's in the box. Yeah, it was 1997's sequel to uh, the John Landis classic American Werewolf in London. Uh, American Werewolf in Paris. Sequel. That's a very loose term, I guess. It, yeah, it, it pretty much just has werewolves and the kind of undead spirits that follow them around. And pretty, much, pretty much exactly it. the same kind of setup plot. Mm. As an American werewolf in London, except this time it has skinhead werewolf, French Nazi style bad guys. <laughs> and guess. and a bloke tied up in a basement. Yes. That has quite a decent moustache and a goatee. That that kind of looks like it's it's it looks like it's stuck on. That doesn't look like one that's been grown. Anyway, um so yeah, American Werewolf in Paris. You've got a group of American tourists all bros going thrill on. seekers yeah let's, let's go on a bro trip around europe bro totally bro and uh they break into the eiffel tower in the middle of the night and find this girl who's about to jump off and commit suicide and one of them saves her a guy called andy and it turns out that this girl is spoiler alert a werewolf and that through a very, very complicated and convoluted plot, she was trying to kill her life after she ended up killing both her father and her mother as, a, as an act of repentance. And it turns out then there's all these other werewolves that are going to use a formula which can then let them turn into a werewolf at any time, not just at the full moon. And then they're going to try and march across the world. You know, global domination. 
never gets that far. It never gets beyond a church. <laughs> and that whole kind of serum subplot doesn't really feature until right at the very end. Now, I have seen American Werewolf in London. It was so long ago that I'll be damned if I could actually genuinely remember much about it. It was lost long in the mist of time that I caught late one night when I was probably drunk at college. So I do know that I have seen it, but I can't remember much about it. I, I first saw it uh, from returning from a night in. It was on the Sci-Fi Channel, believe it or not. That's the first time I saw it at like two in the morning. It was the last movie on and I stayed up to watch it and fell in love with it. Yeah, I think it was more or less about the same kind of time period. But it, I think it was on BBC One, BBC Two one night. That'd be about right. Something like that, because we didn't have uh, satellite TV until until I was much older. Um, so, yeah. What can I say about this movie? Well, I'm going to judge this movie as just this movie, as opposed to measuring it up against the original. I'm going to let you do that. Not only you, Andy, but also you audience out there, if you watched along with this. I want you to do all that kind of compare and contrast. I'm just going to look at this as an actual movie. And as a natural movie, it is it's all right. <laughs> you know, I'm. It's the, I'm, it's I'm the best way of putting it. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lay praise where it's not unduly earned. But at the same time, I've seen a hell of a lot worse than this. You know, I've I've seen some utter utter garbage. I mean, this was basically an MTV version of a horror movie. This it, this yeah, was like Buffy the, Buffy the Werewolf Slayer. It did have that late 90s teen horror yeah. kind of vibe, which it never should have had. No, it was. it's too soft on the horror. It's too much on the comedy, which, you know, I don't mind, but it, it no pun intended, but it didn't have that kind of bite that it needed to have. Huh. You, you never really felt like the characters were in any real mortal danger. You never really felt that there was any kind of presence or anything that could completely derailed the whole thing at any time even right at the very end you you knew that it was all going to end up going together quite well and that we're going to have a happy ending i could just feel it because of the time period i thought no this is going to have a happy saccharine ending which it does and it, it didn't need to do that i would have liked to have seen something like this with more darkness more edge like the, the originals the original yes like an american wealth in london like an american yeah. wealth in london um but just taking it as its own movie, as long as you go in with really low expectations, it kind of just meets those expectations. You're not really dis I wasn't actually disappointed watching this. And considering that the main female lead is uh, Julie Delpy, who was in uh, the Richard Linklater before Sunset, before Midnight, all, all that garbage that, to, to be quite frank, I hated... <sighs> I preferred her in this than I did in that. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, the hatred rains down on you, Mr. Hester. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, you, you wanted the everyman's opinion. You're getting it. At least something happens in this film. All those art students that don't listen to our show are going to be so pissed if they ever get wind of this. <laughs> I know. But it, stuff happens in this. You know... <laughs> There's there's events which connect to other events, which then carry what's known as a plot along. Uh, it's not just two people randomly walking about contemplating their own navels for an hour and a half. So you know, I was I was kind of on board with that. Um, the rest of it, though, it's it was just a bit safe. I would have liked it to have been more dark, a bit more oppressive. Oh, yeah, it's Paris. It's the City of Light. But does everything need to be shot in broad daylight in the middle of the day? Give us something which is going to be a bit more a bit more spooky. And it kind of gets to one point where it feels like it might do that at a cemetery. Mm. Where Andy picks up a girl and they go to a cemetery and they're making out and they're about to have sex. And then he transforms into a werewolf. And you think, okay, yeah, maybe this is going to kick something off. But no, they're being followed by Inspector Clouseau and his dog. <laughs> and he ends up dead. She gets turned into one of these undead critters. And the whole thing is just played for laughs. So it's like, if you're going to play it for laughs, play it for laughs. Lean into it. Properly go for it. Yo, Mel Brooks, that shit. Just, if you're going to go for horror, go for horror. Just... 
set your ground. You can achieve both. Edgar Wright achieved both with Shaun of the Dead, which is yes. both a really funny film and a really good horror. And years later, I might add. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it flounders. So, yeah, it's, it's all right. That's that's my tuppence. How much better would it have been if uh, suddenly the hero of the movie turned out to be Ortiz the dog boy from Freaked? Ortiz the dog boy. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, that would have been awesome. But the same uh, director, okay. wasn't it? Anthony Waller. Yeah. No. No? No. Uh, Anthony Waller, um, he became, uh, around this time, just before this movie, and I guess how he got the gig for An American Wealth in Paris, he made a movie called Mute Witness. Okay. Which was... Um, was that was a prequel kind of... to Silent Witness? No. <laughs> no. Okay. But good joke, though. Um, Mute Witness was uh, this thriller, and I think it was filmed in Germany or Prague or somewhere like that. And it was kind of this really indie hit in 1995. And it was like the last uh, movie of Sir Alec Guinness. So oh. Anthony Waller was the last person to direct Alec Guinness, who no doubt was still cussing out Star Wars on the yeah, set. Yeah, he of probably Guinness. was. And Anthony Waller got the gig of directing this. Originally, they did go back to John Landis first. And John Landis did turn in a draft of the script and then decided, no, nah, don't want to do it, which is probably the first good smart move (laughs) that John Landis has done in his film career. But this script for this movie went through, must have been something like 16 to 18 writers before it got the version that we've got. And that's why I think it feels like so many pieced together good bits from various Mm. scripts that have just gone into this $22 million movie. And American World from London was nowhere near that budget either, I don't think. But uh, this was uh, sold as a negative pickup to um, is it Hollywood Pictures. Yeah, it was. I think Hollywood it was one of the Pictures, Weinstein yeah. companies. Yeah. Yeah. And boy, is there any better term to talk on this movie than a negative pickup? Oh yeah. I mean, as soon as I saw the Hollywood Pictures logo, I just thought, oh, we're in for a treat. <laughs> yes, it's like the, the the bastard cousin of Touchstone Pictures. So we, yeah. We don't. Talk about this one until they do an, another arachnophobia. We don't want to hear about any of your movies. Just, just churn them out. Churn them out. Um, as always, I mean, I do not like to shit on people's movies. And Anthony Waller is, is a competent director. I think after this, he's done only a handful of more movies. I think one was The Guilty with Bill Pullman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was going to do the Bill Pullman uh, Family Guy thing. Uh, but I won't. And he did another movie called Nine Miles Down with Adrian Paul from Highlander, The Source. Oh, okay. God <laughs> almighty. So you can kind of see that downward trajectory on Anthony Waller. Is it, uh, is nine, is it called Nine Miles Down because he just got past scraping the bottom of the barrel? <laughs> yeah, probably what it was on the releases. Right. Um, but this movie, delving into it from when I was looking at it this week. Okay, Julie Delpy. Mm-hmm. Man, she must have really wanted that house. That's all I can say. <laughs> this this was in that phase of Julie Delpy movies where she appeared topless in pretty much every movie she was in, apart from before Sunrise. Funnily um, enough, you should mention that. One thing I did notice is that when she does turn into the werewolf, the werewolf has multiple nipples. <laughs> she, the werewolf has got like about six six or eight nipples down the front as the, as, as her shirt rips open. I thought, oh, okay. Nice little touch. Yeah, that is a nice little touch, but surely when she does the topless scenes, she would have had those six nipples there. Mm. Or do they just grow in a really, really tragic and terrible CGI? I think they just grow in because they weren't there when she was straddling the, the, the guy on the bed. Yeah, that that was a pure ad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was there was no need to even do that. But they did it anyway. Bros um, need boobs, yo. Tom Everett Scott, I saw this performance. And suddenly realised that my acting was not that bad. (laughs) It's really hard. I feel so bad for him because this was like his first feature. And Mm. it feels like it's the first time he's ever been in front of a camera. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's the uninspiring character or writing that he has. But I noticed one scene where they finally discover where um, Julie Delpy lives. And I hadn't realised it before. But how fucking tall is Tom Everett Scott in comparison to his two mates? Yeah, they're easily like about a foot shorter than he is. He's freakishly tall. But 
when I look at him on screen, the one thing that really just stood out for me as a question was, did they just choose the one actor who already looks like he's going through the transformation into a werewolf? Possibly, but you know who he actually reminded me of? Go on. Uh, the uh, the guy who played Ramsay Bolton in Game of Thrones. Oh, yes, you're throwing out your typical Game of Thrones. You know I don't watch that shit. I know, he just looked like the exact same actor. I kept on expecting him to cut someone's dick off at some point. Uh, uh, Tom Everett Scott is taking a role here because Chris O'Donnell was unavailable and he was doing Batman and Robin. <laughs> you know Chris O'Donnell was on that shortlist. <laughs> I guarantee you, if we go through the casting notes for American World for London, Chris O'Donnell was number one, and Tom Everett Scott was somewhere like 11 or 12. Yeah, if that. You can tell it's kind of written for this guy, and it would have been a better movie with Chris O'Donnell doing it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a strange one. Yeah. I mean, the, what doesn't work for it, especially uh, I was taking notes and I was looking here saying, what isn't working about this movie? The because CG. I know it's a terrible movie. The, the CGI, it's the worst possible CGI werewolf. But the main problem is they're showing it all the time. Yeah. American Werewolf in London didn't show you the werewolf. Uh, right? h- how many times can you go for the show don't tell mentality? But yeah, that works if you're writing a script, but not if you write in horror. You keep everything low. You keep the lighting low. You keep the monster hidden. You have little flashes here and there. You build up the suspense in the audience's mind. You don't just shove everything out there and have two of them fight like bald monkeys going at it. I'm I'm telling you, CGI ruled this movie so much, I had to check the credits to see if Stephen Summers was directing The Bastard. Oh! Right. And that's not a knock on Stephen Summers. You're very good at what you do, sir. Um, but it's a horror comedy hybrid where the humour is a colossal fail. Yeah. Someone thought that chewing condom scene was hilarious. But yeah, yet again, they steered way too close to that MTV bro culture. Yeah, even American Pie didn't go that far. No. With the, the lame choice. But it, the fact that they were so happy to show the CGI werewolves at every opportunity... Killed it. Hmm. It would have been so much better with, you know, smoke, mirrors, and shadows. Everything that truly works for a really great horror film, like it did with the original. You did not see, you only saw little tiny snippets of this thing until the very end when you saw it in the uh, the cinema. You know you haven't seen the movie in a while and don't remember it, but it is a masterclass on how to work with very little. American Wealth in Paris, it, it's a cash-in title at the end of the day, for sure. Filled with the most stupidest soundtrack I've ever heard. Filled with Boosh tracks when people knew Boosh for a week. (laughs) You know, it's like, as soon as I'm hearing it, I'm like, oh no, this is the bad 97. I remember this. It's got a soundtrack which sounds like it belongs in like a skater comedy, doesn't it? It does. I would expect the soundtrack in She's All That. Yeah. Or in like no. an early Brendan Fraser movie, like like California Man, or in Sino oh, Man, sh- if you're in the US. Shit, I'd expect this in Slapper. She's French. Yeah, you know. But American Wealth in London had great songs like Blue Moon and all of these different variations of Bad Moon Rising by Credence and stuff mm. like that that really fit with it. None of these songs fit with the movie you are watching. It's it's it's, t- it's irony. A tone deaf, isn't it? The whole yeah. thing, kind of all the way through, it, it does. It, it knows that it was just made to be a cash grab and that any kind of goodwill that might have been originally there when it was written or in the very first few drafts or whatever, that is just gone. It's gone. It's yeah. now here just to be a cash grab, cashing in on the name, like so many other straight to video sequels. But this actually got a cinema release, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah. It did. Uh, the, the problem being, I hate these characters. And you're not supposed to, but. The performances are so weak because the characters are really just bleh. Mm. The only really good character is Julie Bowen, who plays the graveyard girl. That yeah, you know, I mean, she she's fully in there, and it's like you know, only a year before she was in Happy Gilmore as the love interest. Yeah, you know, and something went seriously wrong with her agent. All I can say, you know, that hey, this is going to be a great thing. But um, there's one shot in there that I really did like. So coming from the creative aspect, it is a scene where his friend is in the sewer and he looks in the hole and you see the eyes. Yes. I thought that 
was brilliant. Yeah. You know, and it gen- genuinely did have a really good jump scare moment when it came out. That is, it needed more moments like that. Yeah. Hide the monster, build up the tension, maybe have more from the monster's eye view, rushing towards him, series of quick cuts as he runs away, shadow on a wall, howling, yeah. and then ultimately he thinks he's got away, <clears throat> pulled back in somewhere. It reminded me of that scene in um, Doom, and Doom is not a great movie. But there is that scene because Doom is so dark mm. and really does keep you on edge for some certain scenes. Because I went to the cinema to see it. So did I. And, and you have that scene where you just see the eyes in the dark and then suddenly, you know, that jump scare reveal. I thought it's brilliant. Because yeah. it works. We're all scared of the dark. But there is nothing to be scared of in this movie because they show you these CGI werewolves walking on two legs, you know, in the sewers and stuff like that. And you're just like, this is like underworld. <laughs> you know, it's about as scary as uh, it's about as scary as that as well. Um, so yeah, it was a painful experience to go through. I think it could have worked. It, it had a promising director, and I don't know what went wrong here. I don't know if notes came down from uh, you know the the main producers, and they had a few producers on there. I don't know if he had full control over it, but from the director of Mute Witness, I would have expected more from this movie. I think you could probably reasonably chalk it up to studio interference. Yeah, it was a negative pickup, so I think it's come from mainly, you know, your financiers and stuff like that. Right. I, I can imagine what scenes would ask to be put in, mm-hmm. because me as a director, I would never have gone that route with a werewolf movie. There's certain things you've got to do. For one, if you're basing a story on the fact that, oh, you know, we won't need to use a full moon anymore, and we can go around as we wish, it's like, yeah kind of takes the whole werewolf thing out of it, really, and you're just big dogs now. <laughs> I know? mean, it, the the werewolves in uh, What We Do in the Shadows were scarier than this. <laughs> they really were, because, <laughs> yes, because you had all of the comedy moments earlier on, but when they actually became the werewolves, low lighting, dark shots, fleeting images, lots of blood gore, people getting dismembered, and it they became really scary. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm in full agreement on that. Yeah. Uh, American Wealth in Paris, you know, it's kind of deserving of a 7%. Mm, I would probably place it a little bit higher, maybe like about 15 or so. You're so I, kind. I, I don't think it's, it's not a 7, but it, it's, it doesn't deserve to be any real higher than about 15, I don't think, no. No, I think the, the only real positive of the movie is Chris O'Donnell was actually thankful for Batman and Robin. <laughs> Uh, First time anyone said that about it, yeah. I, I, I guarantee you he was on that list. I, yeah. I can feel it in my bones. Uh, so, okay, American Wealth in Paris. That was uh, what's in the box uh, for this week. Any final word on it? Uh, yeah, it uh, did spark off a... Uh, you, you know how when I talk about The Last Jedi, I kind of go on about oh, one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, this kind of triggered my partner, uh, about how she feels about Twilight. So this afternoon, it did lead to a good half hour conversation about Twilight and the werewolves and the sparkly vampires and all the rest of it. And I'm very, very glad I've not seen any of those fucking films. So yeah. Oh, you better hope there's not one rated below 25. Oh God. I really don't don't even care. You're not even seeing them in order. No. You'll just see whatever version comes through. Anyway, you get, we... your girlf- get your f- girlfriend to tell you the story leading up to that, that one. <laughs> it's one woman's choice between bestiality and necrophilia. That's all I know. Yes, that's so the tagline says. Yes. Okay, well, that was uh, the What's in the Box review. So uh, let's get on to some anniversaries. We watch them again all of the time. Oh, we get them on Prime for free. We only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. You know what? I'm thinking because we are in October that we should actually find some seasonal music of some Halloweeny stuff. Because you know that the majority of movies released in October, anniversary wise, are horrors, right? Yeah, they're going to be all spoopy, yeah. Yes, so we do need a, a, some spooky vibe music. Maybe some Scooby Doo. That sounds more Martians. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, with that in mind, let's start our anniversaries this week. Okay. Um, oh, as usual. Speaking of what you do, uh, speaking of Scooby Doo, Velma's now a lesbian, everybody. Yay! A lot we didn't know. <laughs> Are we finally going to see the real version of the Scooby-Doo movie now that we mentioned <laughs> like six episodes ago where it was actually said that she was a lesbian character in that? I've I've so. seen a version of a Scooby-Doo movie, but uh, it wasn't <laughs> the one that James Gunn did. Anyway, carry on with, your, with the anniversaries. <laughs> Might not be James Gunn, but I bet you there was a blast or two. Mm. Okay, 40 years ago, Steve. Really? Amityville 2, The Possession... Mm. was released. Uh, no, I haven't seen it. I don't think anyone has, no. to be honest. Uh, because, right, come on. We expect everyone has seen the original 1979, the Amateurville Horror. You'd uh, expect starring... so, wouldn't you? Yes, but I know you haven't. Of course you haven't. You know, it's a fucking <laughs> movie podcast. And why, would, why would you come on here even knowing a single fucking movie? I've not movie? even seen the Ryan Reynolds one. <laughs> not a lot of people did, I don't oh. believe. I did, but I was just like, yeah, I didn't really need to see that after all. And it's too weird looking at Ryan Reynolds being serious horror roles. Yeah. Just doesn't, just doesn't work nowadays. Um, yes. So Amateurville 2 is, it's terrible. Okay. Uh, it was directed by, uh, an Italian director by the name of, get this, that I have a feeling I'm going to say this name and my furniture is going to start levitating. His name is Damiano Damiani. <laughs> that is actually a cool name. Yeah. Uh, and he's passed on, now, oh, bless him. But uh, he was more known in the 60s and 70s for making um, kind of Italian cop movies and gangster movies. So he did movies like, um, you won't have heard of them, but there were movies called uh, The Reunion. Uh, there was Mafia. Confessions of a Police Captain was a really good one. Arturo's Island. A whole bunch of these Italian movies that you've never heard of uh, throughout the 60s and 70s. And one of the only real American movies that he made was Amateurville to the Possession. Right. uh, Which has got Dino De Laurentiis' name stamped all over the bastard. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So Um, you kind of know what to expect. I I, am... I'm incredibly sceptical with these things because these are horror movies that are based on, in massive quotation marks, true events. This is Ed, so. Ed and Lorraine Warren, who's uh, who are basically just infamous. They have they have informed and inspired the Conjuring series, and you've got um, well, I can't remember his name, but he was in uh, Watchmen as uh, as Patrick as Ed Wilson. Warren. Patrick Wilson, yeah, he was in those as uh, Ed Warren and, and Vera Famiga. And Vera Famiga, that's the other one as well. So I would have got there eventually. Eventually, yeah, but we've only got an hour. Yeah, and uh, no, the these kind of real events, they're always portrayed as these dark and horrible and demon-filled events, when in reality, they're nothing ever close to this. So there's so much in here which just has to be taken with a pinch of salt. And I'm not farting, that is a police helicopter. <laughs> is that a police chopper? <laughs> no, I think it's got its truncheon stuck in the door. Oh, right. <laughs> it's it gone. You never know. You never know in this neighbourhood. It seems to have gone. Okay. It's Damio Demani, whatever his name is. Yeah. If it comes back, it's fine. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I insist. All right. What were you saying? I, can't I was distracted. I was distracted because <laughs> I was making sure they weren't looking for me. <laughs> no, I was just saying how they, with movies like this, because they're based based on true events, they embellish the hell out of them. Just something wrong. So. I I can't really get behind any of it. Oh shit! It's the Warrens in the chopper. They've heard what you're saying. <laughs> you, you you said the name Damien Diamani or whatever the hell his name De- was. Damiano Damiani. Damiano Damiani. And now the Warrens have risen from the grave. Come to get you. I know. Um, well, you know what. I'm actually going to blame Amateurville 2 for the glut of shitty Amateurville movies that still come out to this day. And they come out so direct. I don't even think they go direct to DVD anymore. I think they just go straight to streaming and you find them as like little add-on characters on Roku. Yeah. But Amateurville, it felt like there was one coming out every year. 
and uh, the original one was good. It did the trick. It was quite spooky for its day. I know as a kid, I was terrified of even watching it. I remember it was on ITV. It's like the premiere of it. And I was shitting myself. Um, and I didn't watch it, but I stayed up in a room with a pillow over my head, trying to obviously drown myself from seeing Amateurville 2 in the next couple of years' time. Um, what's infamous about this movie to this day is the original version that they showed to test audiences was probably one of the worst experiences you could ever have of watching Amateurville 2 because we know about Italian horror. They set out to shock. This is where, you know, City of the Lost Children and, and stuff like that came from. Yeah. You know, so it's over gore. That's, that's French, know, though, isn't it? City of Lost Children. That was Jean Pierre's you know. No, no, it's not um, City of the Living Dead. I apologize. Right. City yeah. of the Living Dead. Um, and it was all the Dario Argento yeah. style. Yeah, Lucio Fulci and stuff like that. Yeah, they were just overly sick and gross and, and you know, grotesque horror films. Amateurville 2 featured two scenes that needed to be cut out, so the test audiences said. One for a brutal anal rape scene, and the second for an incestuous sex scene between a brother and sister. Okay. Only in Italy. And that footage, as I can tell, has never been seen. You can easily see when you watch the movies where the cuts have happened, because they are very quick cuts in them, so I'm guessing that's exactly where those scenes were to take place. Uh, But that is... The story that you always kind of remember from the Amateurville to the possession. Well, I'm sure you do. I'm, I'm, I'm nonplussed by the whole thing, to be perfectly honest. Well, there you go. Now you've got that story to go with your uh, Jeff Daniels Squid and the Whale story. Yeah, I can't remember her name. Anna Paquin. That's, That's the, the one. one. Fly away home and the Squid and the Whale. You will never see two films that will disturb you even more uh-uh. unless you watch them together. But yes, uh, 40 years ago, Amateurville to The Possession reached number one at the box office. So people were still hungry for Amateurville. And I can't imagine Amateurville 3, starring Meg Ryan, uh, came anywhere near close. I think this was where Amateurville probably should have stopped. Yes, I think this is where a lot of franchises, horror or otherwise, should stop. Um, But okay, what do we have next? And please don't say that it's Exorcist 2. No, no, no. But I will add on to the fact that I have actually been to, well, it used to be at Columbia Ranch before there have been bulldozers in Columbia Ranch, rest in peace. Uh, that is where the mock up of the Amsterville house was. And I have stepped into that house. Ooh. And uh, it's pretty spooky, even going into a recreated set of it. Wait, was that the one that they used for the Ryan Reynolds one, or was that one that's been there even longer? I think that is the one that they would have used. Because I, I know the. The real house is out in New Jersey. Yeah. Somewhere. And the house that they used for Amateurville 1 and 2 is not the same house. So, obviously, they are houses that are a little bit further on from that. So, they didn't actually go and use the house. But that house is famous. You all know the shape of it. And you could put that house anywhere and you'd believe that that's where it was actually happening. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, what do we have next, then? Okay, uh, it's a a nice honourable mention. I like bringing an honourable mention in because in 1990, a movie called Dark Angel was released. Or, if you're from the US, it was called I Come in Peace. Sorry, do you need a lozenge? Yes. Okay. Uh, I Come in Peace. Uh, Have you heard of this movie? Is that Dolph Lundgren? It is a Dolph Lundgren movie. Following his uh, Rocky Fall. And Red Scorpion roles. I think this was the next movie in the line. Directed by the ever-reliable Craig R. Baxley. You know the name Craig R. Baxley, surely? Do you remember that well? Uh, I I know the name. Well, give me a hint. What's he done? Okay. Well, Craig R. Baxley uh, started out doing a lot of stunts work, stunt coordinator, stunts direction. More infamously on Predator, which mm-hmm. is where his profile catapulted. So he was responsible for all of the the stunt shooting on Predator, and then he went to direct his first movie called Action Jackson. Oh, yes, which is a favourite of yours, isn't it? It is, yeah. yes. I, I do love me some Action Jackson. I love Craig R. Baxley's movies because they are so out there action movies, but you really enjoy them. So a few years after this, he went and directed Stone Cold with hey! Brian Bosworth. 
That film keeps coming around all the time, doesn't it? This has got to be viewed on our show, I think. I think yeah. we've got to do it. Um, so. But in between Action Jackson and Stone Cold, he directed the movie Dark Angel, also known as I Come in Peace, which is the story of Dolph Lundgren playing a Dallas cop uh, whose partner gets killed in a drugs raid. But the uh, the drugs raid, everyone was murdered there by an alien from another planet who steals cocaine from drug barons to drug innocent people so that he can stab them in the head and retrieve a rare drug from the brain that is like an endorphin that is worth millions on his planet right so we know what the writers of this script were on Yes, when they wrote it that sounds like what was the name of that um, Rutger Hauer film where the 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 city of London's all been flooded. Oh my God! Split second. Split second. It <laughs> sounds like that because the beginning of it sounds like just a series of normal murders, and then by the end of it, there's an eight foot monster with these weird long arms that are, that he's coming out of. He come, just comes out of nowhere. That's that. It sounds like what that plot is. That you've just well, described to me. I'm going to be honest with you. I love Dark Angel, I Come in Peace. I, this is one of the guilty pleasure movies for me. I watched it again recently, and I think the only thing that I was really shocked by is exactly how much ADR is put in this movie. Uh, and it's obviously a move done for the hard of thinking, because there's a lot of ADR in there on stuff that's like, I would have got that anyway. Mm. But they are thinking there is someone out there who needs these numbers painted for them. The one thing I will say to the people who hold the rights at the moment, and I think it's MGM, I think MGM hold the rights. Guys, is it so hard to get a version of this movie where the sound is not mono? Right? This deserves better sound than what you are pushing it out with. You'll have to get in touch with Jeff Bezos now. Amazon owns MGM now. I know. I'd, I'd probably get this movie free on Amazon now. Because yeah. I noticed that they've chucked all the James Bond films for free on Prime now. It's a good job it's not on uh, Warner Brothers, otherwise you won't be able to see it at all, would you? Oh, I'm, I'm sure I'd know someone who has it. It'd be in your um, library and then just phew, disappear. I, I'm, I'm throwing this out that Dark Angel is an amazing movie and one we, we do have to watch. There's not really many noticeable names in there. I know them, obviously. So he's got a partner, Brian Benben, who's a, an FBI agent he's partnered with, uh, who is, guess, the comet relief. You know, he's very up his own arse, thinks he's better than everyone else, and really is just a wimpy little guy. Yeah. Uh, Matthias Hughes plays the main big bad alien guy. Uh, and this was the first real big movie I saw him in. And you'll know him from so many, like, director, video action movies and martial arts movies from back in the day. And for a long time, I actually thought he was Vigo the Carpathian, but it turns out it wasn't. Johnny boy! Johnny boy! <laughs> you know what? Yesterday morning while I was writing, I had In the Mouth of Madness on. Did you? And as soon as that bit happened, I burst out laughing because I remember how you caught me on the podcast with it. Johnny boy! Yeah. Johnny boy. It's a, it's a good film. To be honest, I've not seen In the Mouth of Madness for quite a while as well. I won't mind rewatching that sometime soon. It's still great, but the only weak yeah. thing in it is the woman actress who's with him. And her performance in some parts is really cringeworthy. You feel sorry for Sam Neill, but Sam Neill just nails this movie. It really is. In fact, everyone. The, everyone in, in the roles is great, but this poor actress just delivers one scene where she's like, I'm losing me. And uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. not good. But getting back to Dark Angel. Yes. Um, it's full of action. The explosions are loud as hell, I know, because I nearly blew my speaker up. But the dialogue is so weak. Yeah, it, It's just low on that transfer. This was a Blu-ray as well, which is just shocking. Um, the music is incredible. And there's, there's some great character work in it. But it is a movie with excessive amounts of ADR. I reckon there should be an option on uh, Blu-ray where you can watch the movie without the ADR. Well, that would make Hercules in New York very interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> there's there's a lot of movies out there. And the weird thing is now that I'm re-watching them and I've got the the Sony speakers now with my big screen stuff. I'm just re-watching all these old movies and I'm picking up ADR like you would not believe. 
it's like, it just sounds terrible. And in mm. some cases, it's like that doesn't even sound like the actor who's saying it. No. That sounds like the guy who redubs the beat films for BBC in the eighties. Yeah. Sometimes it works, but a lot of the times it does sound like you're you're listening to, like you say, a made for TV version of the movie. Exactly. It, and, Robocop syndrome again. Yeah. I mean, I cannot crib on Dark Angel at all. And I can't crib on Craig Arbaxi because I enjoy his films so much because they are <laughs> there's something about them where they should be more elevated than they are, but a lot of them kind of came out directed video, mm -hmm. or they had a US release and it didn't do so well, so it kind of got released straight to video here, which was a common practice, like collateral damage. Mm, God, yeah, <laughs> with Arnie. Uh, that was but no. Um, I, I love, I love me some Dark Angel, no, okay. and uh, it, it's got some brilliant lines in it. And you'd think if that was delivered a little better, that'd be brilliant. I want to see that movie remade. If, if MGM are interested, I would happily write that movie. So get in touch. Yeah, he, just uh, send him a load of the cocaine so he knows exactly what it is he's talking about. <laughs> yes. um, okay, so that was your honourable mention. What is next on the official countdown? Well, in the official countdown, 30 years ago this week, a movie called Patriot Games was released. Oh, not seen that. Oh, for fuck's sake, Steve. Seriously, man. We usually get at least one movie you've seen every week. I, I saw American Werewolf in Paris. Because you had to. <laughs> yeah, I still saw it, though. Uh, Don't know what we've Games. got next, anyway. Yes, well, Patriot Games is uh, the introduction of Harrison Ford as Jack Ryan, which he would do again in uh, Clear and Present Danger. Mm -hmm. Brilliant movie. Before he was replaced by Ben Affleck in The Sum of All Fears and then replaced by Chris Pine in Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit and then replaced again by oh, John Krasinski in Jack Ryan series. Uh, and the sad thing is, is uh, Harrison Ford is the one person who has played this character more than anyone else. Mm. I, 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 too, I because it was The Sum of All Fears, though. What? I have seen the sum of all fears. Oh, great. You've seen the worst one out of the one. <laughs> so, no, actually, no, it's, it's it's not that bad. Have you seen Shadow Recruit? <sighs> no. No. Um, Patriot Games was deemed as controversial in a day, but I don't really see what the controversial was because obviously it was dealing with the IRA mm -hmm. or a kind of breakout cell of the IRA that had fucking Sean Bean in it and Patrick Bergen. Um, not your first kind of choice for Irish actors. I, I guess you'd have Patrick Bergen in there, but I, yeah. I, I think that kind of controversy might be higher in this country and in the the Republic of Ireland than it would be in the US. This this yeah. would definitely be something which would start to. It, it's like the whole Michael Collins thing, you know. In the US, it's just a film, whereas over here, it becomes like a real big political biting point. So yeah, I can see that. No, yeah, I, I look at movies as art, and, and I look at Michael Collins as a really, really, really great film. Mm. Um, and you kind of got, got to put that politics aside because art is about seeing all different points of view. Um, Patriot Games is probably the first time it's been called art. But this was a pretty big movie uh, in the day uh, because we'd just come off the Hunt for Red October, which was the Jack Ryan movie before this. Starring yep. Mr. Baldwin himself, Alec Baldwin, as Jack Ryan. And he didn't do a really bad job at it. I can't remember what kept him from coming back and doing Harrison Ford, other than the fact that Harrison Ford was obviously a bigger name, and yeah. they probably just took the role. Um, it was directed by Philip Noyce. And Philip Noyce is a really great director, especially for dramas. You know, he had some, some very bizarre movies in uh, his resume. Uh, Philip a... Noyce were Australian director, you know, the, the class of Mulcahy, as we mentioned it. So he did Dead Calm with Nicole Kidman. I've seen that one. Yeah, which is a, a terrific thriller. Mm -hmm. You know, starring only three people. It's just amazing. Uh, from there, he directed a Rutger Hauer movie, funny enough. Oh, Rutger, Rutger's doing it this week. Oh, yeah. Uh, called Blind Fury, which was basically a, a remake of Zatoichi, where Rutger Hauer was this blind samurai and it's it's a it's actually a really fun 
movie, really great movie. And over the night, later in the years, he, he kind of directed a lot of really well-respected dramas, stuff like Rabbit Proof Fence, uh, the, the remake of The Quiet American. Uh, he also did stuff like The Giver, Newsfront. He's done these incredible movies. And, of course, he did Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger. Nice. Uh, Patriot Games, it's kind of based in fact, uh, because there's a scene where Harrison Ford rescues uh, Edward Fox, who's this like Prime Minister-style character from these IRA cell kind of terrorists led by Sean Bean. And it was based on when um, when Princess Anne, uh, she was attacked uh, by a gunman and a member of the public came to her, her aid and saved her from this gunman, if you know your history. So it is kind of based in a little bit of fact. And in this movie, it has a tremendous cast. Uh, you also have James L. Jones in there doing his second of three turns as Admiral James Greer. Uh, you also have Anne Archer, who is my favourite of this period. She, she was the actress for me back in the day. Uh, you had a very young Thora Birch playing their daughter. And some really great English thespians in there. And of course, you had Richard Harris as well, who was playing... Uh, He's kind of an IRA leader who helps Jack Ryan because this cell is broken off and they want him taken out. Patriot Games is a brilliant movie that doesn't get as much love as Hunt for Red October and Clear and Present Danger. And you can kind of forget the other movies that came out afterwards. Do you think you? it's? Do you think it might be because of the um, the just like the sterling job that John McTiernan did with Hunt for Red October? I don't know. I think, I mean, it was a sizable shift, but I know that this is the one movie of Tom, that Tom Clancy's source material that he has distanced himself from. Mm, I wonder why. I think it might be due to creative liberties on the script with the story, maybe. Um, But it is the only one out of all of them. And I'm there thinking, didn't he see Shadow Recruit? I think he was dead by then. Is he? Or is he? Well, as far mm. as I know, he's dead. You never know with these people. Mm, because uh, just dipping into my video game world for a second. Um, yeah, he signed away uh, the rights to use the Tom Clancy name. It's in Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six, etc., etc. A couple of years, like about two years or so before he died. And uh, I know he's, I think he's been dead for at least 10 years now. So chances are that that's, that came out after his, uh, he died. So there you go. That's interesting. Mm. Uh, He was kind of like, uh, it was always between Tom Clancy and John Grisham. (laughs) They they had a movie coming out every month or a mini series or something like that. But I remember that was just books flying in and out of stores. And uh, I did actually buy the book of Patriot games to read before the movie came out. And I got halfway through it. You know, and I can tell there were sizable differences in just that half mm. way before the movie came out. I think I stopped to read the Street Fighter book. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I I read um I read Rainbow Six because uh, as as far as that was concerned, he said to him, "Right, you make the game. I'll re- I'll write the book." And so he wrote the book for Rainbow Six. And this thing, this thing's bigger than Lord of the Rings. Wow! So it's it's huge. And it's that's dense. a series, then, really, isn't it? Eight. You couldn't make it into a movie. That's no. obviously a series. That's a series. One. There. Did he do Ghost Recon? Was that one of? That was. That's well. It's. He, I don't know exactly how much he he had in it, but that had his name attached okay. to it. Yeah. Right. yeah. Just delving into games there, as we do every week. Yeah. Uh so yeah. In talking about Patriot Games, I will actually say I kind of enjoyed this more than Clear and Present Danger. And trust me, Clear and Present Danger is an amazing movie. It was probably. Harrison Ford's finest hour. But there's something about this that is more grounded. And I think Clear and Present Danger felt more kind of fantastical. You know, it's Jack Ryan going up against the president of the USA and having a shouting match with him in his office and stuff like that. I'm pointing at him. Yeah, yeah. How dare you, sir? Don't give me that plane. Um, But Patriot Games feels more grounded and dirtier and grittier. And the Bad guys in this feel much more rounded than they did in Clear and Present Danger. And and to the point of the Hunt for Red October as well, because you you never really got to see the kind of bad guys in the Hunt for Red October. They were kind of just there as a plot device in a way. 
And it was more a game of, is he defecting or is he planning an attack? What is going on? The kind of cat and mouse style stuff. And obviously you had the one person you had to figure out who the villain was. Mm-hmm. No spoilers in case people do want to watch it. Um, I recommend you do watch the hunt for it, October. Um, but Patriot Games, I think, is the best version uh, of the Jack Ryan, early Jack Ryan stuff where the villain's motives are kind of rounded out to the point where you believe in their actions or what they're doing actually does have a proper motivation behind them. And I think that's maybe why it was kind of a a tipping point with a lot of audiences because especially England and Ireland because you know that's a you know that's a conflict that is always yeah. going to be there. Yeah, and it was a good few years before the uh, the Good Friday agreement at that point, so it was still in the height of uh, the IRA activity, car bombings and shootings and all kinds of sectarian violence that was going on in the mainland UK and in in all over Ireland and the Republic. And there's still it's still not settled to this day. But I, from from our point of view, at least, things seem to be easier. So I don't know if a movie like this might possibly have fared better now. I don't know. Oh yeah, at the end of the day, people should just see it. Yeah, right. Um, I I do recommend it. Uh, it's a movie that I do own, uh, and will watch whenever it's on. I will sit and actually watch it. It's just a really, really good thriller, and and I put it up there as the second best Jack Ryan movie after The Hunt for Red October. Okay, cool. And what do we have next? Oh, that's it. That's it. That's, that's it. I kept it short at three for this week. Wow. I, I, was, I was there thinking, you know, oh, we, we got one more. Maybe I can squeeze one in. Maybe I can have actually have seen something this week. No. 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 I feel like such a disappointment to you, Andy. <laughs> well, well, it's 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 all future stuff. You'll come across it at some point. Yes. Yes. Well, all right. Well, for those of you who haven't uh, seen any of those, like myself, Now's probably a good time to uh, go out and find some quality movies, unlike what's coming up next. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? In theory, Steve. In theory. In theory. Right. You do not know. This might just tick the box for you on something that you do like. Yeah, it probably would do, you know, because we've had a bit of a mixed bag so far. Uh, 8mm, I enjoyed in kind of like, like I said at the time, like a 7 kind of way. Uh, and then 3,000 Miles to Graceland. We both, we both liked but agreed that it needed another edit. And then as you've heard earlier on in the episode, American Werewolf in Paris... So, shall we get ourselves on with the segment? So, <laughs> yes. It was kind of getting a bit long-winded. It was a bit, yeah. Yes, just like first thing in the morning. Right, uh, what's in the box is the part of the show where Andy's going to put his hand into a box and pull out a name of a film. Now, if I have seen it, then he's going to keep on pulling out titles of films until he found one that I haven't seen and then I go away and watch it the day before we record our next episode. However, unlike when we started and Andy was pulling out good movies this time around, he's pulling out terrible movies that are guaranteed to be 25% or under on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, so, in theory, Steve. In theory. In theory. In theory. Because terrible movies could be a bit harsh because it is all based on critics. Yes. You can't exactly base whether you're going to enjoy a movie on if a critic has enjoyed a movie. No. Like, for example, I enjoyed the Stallone film Oscar. Yeah, you know what? I actually enjoy that movie too. So do I. I do. Yes. I, I, I think it's really funny. It was yep. a really good departure. And it was better than Stop and My Mum Will Shoot. Oh, God, yes. Right. Anyway, what do we have? Okay. Okay. So, delving into the box this week. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, okay. Okay. This is going to be so hard because the director said. is a friend of mine. Oh, oh God. <laughs> okay. All right. I shouldn't have told you that because you're not going to be biased now. No. He's not a friend of yours, so fuck it. You, you've got to be truthful. Yeah. Steve, mm-hmm. have you seen Stigmata? Stigmata. 
Wait, is that is that the one with um, Ewan McGregor? No. It is Patricia Arquette's Gabriel Byrne. Uh, it's a horror movie from 1999. Hey, we're doing well here. We're getting horror movies in yeah. uh, October. I, I think... God, I can't remember. I think I might be getting it confused with an episode of The X-Files. I'm going to go out be. on a limb and say no, although there was an episode of The X-Files which had... Uh, 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 had kids showing stigmata, and it had the guy from The Hills of Eyes in it. Uh, the bald guy. No, I don't believe it's the same one. No. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, the blurb on this, of which I will read, courtesy of uh, Rotten Tomatoes: A young woman with no strong religious beliefs begins having strange and violent experiences, showing signs of the wounds that Jesus received when crucified. Right. 1999, directed by Rupert Wainwright. Hi, Rupert. Love you, dude. Uh, written by Tom Lazarus and Rick Ramage. Rick Ramage, that sounds like a wrestler. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, released by Metro Goldwyn Mayer back in the day. So Jeff Bezos owns this movie. Uh, okay. Tom so, Lazarus as well. There's a very biblical name. That is a very big name. Also, it's also, kind of weird that Gabriel Byrne is playing a priest in priest. this. Is that right? Yes. And yet he played the devil in uh, End of Days. <laughs> in the same fucking year. In the same year. <laughs> Hopping that fence quite a bit there, yes. Gabriel. Yes, he's Whose so name is Gabriel? Gabriel. Yeah. Okay. And his name is Gabriel. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you also got Jonathan Price in this movie. Plays the Cardinal. Okay. So, so you get one Bond villain in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had Sean Bean earlier. Oh, very true. Yeah. Very true. All right. So uh, that is what's in the box um, for next week. Um, I, I will be incredibly truthful also. Okay. Uh, I have I have seen this movie when it came out. I didn't think it was that bad because I went to see it on the same night. I went to see Sleepy Hollow. So I saw two completely different kind of horror movies right. in one night, uh, which is exhausting when you've only just watched one. And I watched Sleepy Hollow first and was kind of disappointed. So it'll be interesting to see if I was just carrying my rage over onto my yeah, friend's movie. Yeah, I, I, I like Sleepy Hollow, but uh, Mr. Mr. Wainwright, sir, um, I just want you to know that I will be approaching this as a completely blank slate. And uh, yes, I'm going to be as truthful and as honest and just call it as I see it. Well, that's your job. Yes. So it's, it, it's, it's my job to kiss up to people. Yeah, it's your job to kiss <laughs> ass and yes. my job no. to kick ass. Yes, I don't burn my bridges. I let you just fucking bulldoze them. Yes. Um, okay, so it stands at 22%. Okay, that's not bad. With an audience score of 63%. Okay, that's not bad at all. So that's kind of, that's not so bad. It's it's more than um, 8mm got. So yeah. let's just see how this turns out. Okay, well, you'll be able to find out exactly how this turns out next week. Uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us and comment about anything that we've talked about, talking, and if that's not even, you're if, getting into Lord of the Rings again, aren't yeah, you? Yes, I am. Actually, it's Rings of Power o'clock next on Friday. Yes. Hi, Jeff. Um, so, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the way I know that you are not impressed with this show is because you have not spoken a fucking word about it in since it's been going. So I know for a fact that you are living in uh, pure disappointment. Uh, uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to talk to us about anything that we've discussed in this show, then you can get in touch with us through the socials uh, at Pottywood on both Twitter and Facebook. You can also follow us on Reddit if you want to. You know, if you've got nothing better to do with your time. Uh, because we like to hear from you. We like to hear from our audience. We like to know what you think about what we think. And um, um, we're lonely. Yes. Oh, so lonely. Yes. You should see the calluses and... on my right hand. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to tell you how I've got the calluses on my right hand. Mm. Okay. And with that in mind, <laughs> uh, it's time to say goodbye. It's a goodbye from me. And I will see you next week as well, because I've got nothing else better to do. Nope. Till then. Bye. Ow. <laughs>